Please welcome today's speaker, Dr. Desmond Ford. Now, Duncan has bidden me strictly that I'm not to move beyond this line. And although I know you're afraid of preachers, I'm not afraid of you, otherwise I'd be up there. Funny, we like to be in the front of the bus, but the back of the church. Isn't that strange? I am an average sort of husband. And so I frequently do what my wife suggests. And she has told me that I should give you an anecdote from last week, which I will now do. My usual program is more than full with ordinary obligations from GNU, usually via my dear friend Ellie, but also from family and more emails than I can cope with. And there are minor matters like health and a little bit of study or occasionally prepare a sermon or perhaps write an article. That's the usual program. But in the last three months, I have been engaged about 50 hours a week on something extra, a book on Genesis. Now, this is a very intemperate thing to do. It involves nights as well as days. I do not recommend you follow such stupidity unless you are convinced that God is in it, as we are. I say we because Jill does everything to help me. Every line I write, she checks, corrects us matters of style and syntax. I really couldn't do it without her. Anyway, last week, after about three months at 50 hours a week involving days and nights, I was very tired and a temptation came. It doesn't matter how, how old you are, you still get tempted about different things. The main temptation when you're old is to quit. And so the temptation came to me, what on earth are you doing this for? You should be in a rocking chair watching the world go by. This is stupid. Well, I give up and go to lunch and turn on the TV and there is Joyce Meyer, a very great practical woman preacher, and I have caught her in the middle of her telling the story of Peter getting out of the boat because Jesus is on the sea. And these are the first words I hear from Joyce after my temptation to quit. You want a comfort zone, do you? Well, you can have a comfort zone. You can have a quiet, peaceable place, and God will still love you. But let me tell you, you won't accomplish anything. That to me was a message from heaven and changed my whole day and my whole outlook. All future temptations will be different. This is not the only time I've known this sort of thing. When I was a teenager, the Scottish principal at Avondale said, Desmond, you should go to our seminary. He didn't know I didn't have money to go to Sydney. My grandparents sent me enough money for stamps and soap and that was it. But I went to my room and I did what you must not do. This is for stupid people and I was stupid. I went to my room and flicked open the Bible with a prayer and the first words were, this is the thing that thou shalt do. So when I married, we spent nothing except for food and drink. We were saving up to go to America, to the seminary. And after a debate took place with a Church of Christ minister whose debate was to thrash Adventist ministers over the fourth commandment, I was sent to America by the church. When I got there, I was horribly disillusioned because I found that many of the most important there, people there did not believe some things that in Australia you had to believe in my church. I was shocked, I was disillusioned and I was going to go back to be the chairman of the theology department at Avondale College. I was very depressed. I was about to cross a stile to go to Salisbury Hall where my family was staying, very depressed and there seared through my mind not an audible voice but a conviction, it will be all right. It will be all right. Don't worry. And it was. 
Because when I was sacked, I already had a congregation. For the previous two years, while I was at Pacific Union College, I'd been going many, many places. Canada, San Juan, all, all sorts of places. And people had gathered, eager to hear the gospel. So when I was sacked, I had a congregation. It became Good News Unlimited. Anyway, I want to talk to you about Genesis. This is a little bit of what should appear in a few months' time. First of all, about the first sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I could talk to you all day on that verse, but of course, you wouldn't be here, you'd have gone. You know there are 16 translations of that on the moon? Astronaut, one of the astronauts put 16 translations of in the beginning God created the heavens and left it on the moon. Scientists are particularly interested in the first verse of the Bible. Number one, it has contradicted what was the scientific view for millenniums, that the earth was eternal. All sorts of theories, steady state theory, oscillation theory, all sorts of theories. But science emphatically stressed this world had no beginning. The whole universe was eternal. And lo and behold, last century, they changed their minds and every scientist in the world now practically believes what the Bible says. It had a beginning. And I wonder if you've noticed that in the first century, all the areas of science are covered. Have you noticed that? Time and space and force and substance. They're the areas of science. They're all here. In the beginning, time, God, force, made heaven, space, and earth, substance. They're all there. Of course, if we decide not to believe this verse, we have to believe that nothing made everything. We have to believe that non-life made life. We have to believe that something random made fine-tuning. We have to believe that chaos made information, that unconsciousness made consciousness, that the non-rational made the rational. Well, you can believe that, and if you can swallow that, swallowing an elephant would be no problem to you. Yeah, no problem, whatever. The alternatives are simple. You can believe in eternal nothing that made matter and mind, or you can believe in eternal matter that made mind and matter, or you can believe that an eternal mind made mind and matter. Don't say, never mind, no matter. There's only one of those that will fit the same person. Just suppose it's not true. Well, then what am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? How should I live? No animal ever asks any of those questions. No animal ever asks any of those questions. Who am I that I ask them? But what am I? Am I like a flake of foam? Am I like a raindrop? Am I a gnat or a beetle, which will decay very soon and from its substance new life will be formed? What am I? A meaningless clot of coincidental molecules. A great way to begin the day. Look in the mirror, you meaningless clot of coincidental molecules and then read your taxes and the doctor's report and that your daughter's about to get married to a man you hate. Doesn't matter, meaningless clot. Now you're nerved for the day. It's okay, you can stand anything now. Or can you? Or can you? Can we live without meaning? Do you know why there's so much brutality, sexuality that's wrong, hatred and war, particularly among young people, is because they're angry about the meaninglessness of life. When I was a boy, I loved to walk through King's Cross. Loved it. I dare to do it now. It's become a very dangerous place. It's haunted by young people who are half drunk and very fully violent. Why like that? 
They're angry. Life has no meaning. And they kick against the pricks. So the alternatives to believing in Genesis 1-1 are not very inviting. I want you to think of the errors that this verse refutes. It refutes atheism. In the beginning, God. It refutes agnosticism, God. It refutes polytheism, not gods. It refutes materialism, humanism, astrology, all the great errors. If the world had only believed it, how much sorrow, pain and bloodshed the world would have been saved. If only Napoleon Bonaparte Bonaparte had believed it, He shed the blood of millions of soldiers because his God was Napoleon. Idi Amin, Omar Gaddafi, Adolf Hitler, Kaiser Wilhelm. If they'd only believed this verse, there's only one God. We're not gods. We're not gods. It's not right for us to shed rivers of blood because of our greed. It won't do. It won't do. This verse forbids the cyclical view of life. What's that? Well, all the world believed it until God selected Abraham. All nations, including the Polish Greeks, the technological Romans, believed that time was cyclical. Everything was repeated and repeated and repeated. Nietzsche believed that. No wonder he went mad. If you believe that time is ever repeating itself, instead of the linear view of the Bible that time has a beginning and will have an end, if you believe time keeps repeating itself, nothing has value. No person has value. No institution has value. Why help anybody? It's going to decay and it'll happen all over again and again and again and again. And time has no value. The Christian view is so different. In the beginning and then the Sabbath pointed to eternity when there'd be a new heavens and a new earth. And every moment to the Christian is precious. Every moment. I marvel at people who live as though they had a million years. It's a form of insanity. people who spend their lives fidgeting, or to quote my dear friend Ellie, chasing butterflies. People who spend their lives on triviality forget that life is limited, it is brief, and then judgment day. Every moment is precious. I have spent the last 60 years avoiding chronophages. Of course, you know what a chronophage is. It comes from two Greek words. Chronos means time and phagio to eat. When I went to camp meetings, I would sometimes be a bit besieged by dear, precious chronophages. And the only escape I had was if they were masculine to invite them to walk while they talked. That helped a little bit. The cyclical view of time is gone with the Bible. Every moment is important. So you're happy to spend an hour or a day or a week with someone in need, but you will not condescend to fidgeting. You will not condescend to chasing butterflies. You will not condescend to trifles. Wonderful. That every moment of our life is now important. It's glorious. It has infinite possibilities. Every moment. Don't act as though you've got a million years. Use this moment alike. The main question we should be praying about every moment, Lord, is this what I should be doing right now? Genesis 1 is both historical, prophetic, and gospel. And it is magnificently constructed It has seven Hebrew words. I want you to think on this miracle. Anyone in the world today can get the Bible, even for free. But it was written by far, far less than 1% of the world's linguists. Today, not one in a 100,000 knows Hebrew. 
And you've got a book written in Hebrew, part of which is on the moon now. But you know, the first sentence, seven words in Hebrew, and seven times four letters in Hebrew. And the next sentence is seven times two words in Hebrew. And every Hebrew letter stands for a number. All Hebrew grammars tell you that. And so you can work out the number of any word. If you take all the nouns of Genesis 1, they add up to 777. If you take the verb, it amounts to 7 times 20, 29. When you get to the end of the creation story, there are three sentences of seven Hebrew words. And in the middle is always the word seventh. God is the great mathematician. There are over 30 combinations of the number seven in Genesis 1, and the possibility of it happening by chance is one in 30 million. Will you think about that? Yes, Genesis was written by a great mathematician who counts. It's a history, not in our language. If God had spoken about the Big Bang and black, dark matter and dark energy and quantum theory, he wouldn't have helped anybody. In Genesis 1, God's like a tall man bending down to lisp to a little child. What he's trying to get across is there's only one God. Monotheism, it came like a burst of lightning on the scene of the old world. Because of polytheism, there were gods many and goddesses many and all sorts of awful things happened to worship and adore these gods and goddesses. But with Genesis 1 came monotheism, the basis of science. There could be no science until monotheism ruled. That's why Isaac Newton, the great Christian, was the greatest of scientists. No ordinary book. No ordinary book. A history, yes, but in God's terms, to tell us he's our maker, to tell us we have value. You know, that's what we all need to know. That's a good thing we're here. That we mean something. That life is important. That has great value when God is revealed as our Heavenly Father who made everything in the universe for our sake. You know, there are 60 paradigms in the universe which if they budged by a trillionth of a trillionth, we wouldn't be here. Everything in the universe is for you and for me. Everything, everything. We're very important. Don't listen to those who say to you, look, all humanity is only a cosmic speck compared with the immensity of the universe. That's a ridiculous statement. It assumes that size determines value. What's a mountain of mud compared to a fistful of diamonds? The universe would only be a garbage dump but for you and me. Because we can think, we can reason, we can choose. So Genesis 1 tells us there's one heavenly Father and we have infinite value. What a book. What a marvel. When we move into Genesis 2, we find two great institutions. First of all, worship, the Sabbath, then marriage. These are the hinges of the Ten Commandments, the fourth and fifth. From those two come all the other commandments. And they are the hinges of society. When society begins to downgrade worship and the family, society begins to disintegrate. That's where we are in 2014. Society is beginning to disintegrate because it is neglecting worship, because it is neglecting the family. In many, many countries now, people live together without benefit of open public confession of loyalty, without marriage. Marriage is disintegrating. Huge proportion of people live alone these days, not in families. But with marriage and worship disappearing, then also society must die. In Genesis 2 and 3 are the factors that are used as excuses by the great majority of intelligent people on our planet. Tree of life, tree of knowledge, serpent that talks, what rubbish. You have to be nuts if you believe that sort of thing, and I am not nuts. So say the intelligentsia. 
So very carefully listen to what I'm about to say. If you get what I now say in the next five minutes, you will never lose your faith in God, Genesis, Christ or the Bible. So listen very carefully. So we're talking about the Garden of Eden. We're talking about a tree of knowledge. We're talking about a tree of life. We're talking about a talking serpent. Okay, now come with me to John 19.41. What's that got to do with it? Well, it says that in the place Jesus was crucified, what's next? There was a garden. Now, why on earth does John drop that in? Because in this garden, and by the way, a garden is a symbol of death and resurrection. That's where seeds die. That's where seeds live again. Look, you and I move among the living and the dying, and we will die unless Jesus comes very soon. But every garden tells the story of death and resurrection. The seeds are buried. Up they come. And that caterpillar moving around, it goes into its chrysalis. It's dead. No, look, behold, butterfly. How beautiful. And it soars into the heavens. Death, chrysalis, resurrection. In the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden and there was a tree there. The Bible, five times in the New Testament, calls the cross a tree. Galatians 3.13, Acts 5.30, Acts 10.29, Acts 13. 39. Five times the cross is called a tree because, you see, it was a tree of life. And those who find this tree find paradise. Where was the first tree? It was in paradise. We're meant to compare these gardens and these trees. Gethsemane was the beginning of Calvary. It too was a garden. So we're meant to compare the gardens with the gardens of Genesis. Compare Eden, will you? with Gethsemane. In Eden, everything was delightful. In Gethsemane, everything was terrible. In Eden, the battle was by day. In Gethsemane, the battle was by night. In Eden, Eve parleys with the serpent. In Gethsemane, the Son of God talks to his father. In Eden, Eve takes the fruit. Her husband, Adam, takes the fruit from his wife's hand. In Gethsemane, Christ takes the cup from his father's hand. In Eden, God comes looking for Adam. Where are you, Adam? On the cross, beginning in Gethsemane, the last Adam is looking for God. My God, my God, why? My God, my God, where? In Eden, the sword is drawn. In Calvary, the sword is put in place in the sight of Christ. From Eden, Adam was driven. From Gethsemane, Christ was led. In Eden, man falls. Man sins. In Gethsemane, Christ is victor. Man sins, Christ suffers. Adam falls before the tempter. The soldiers that come to take Christ in Gethsemane, they fall before Christ. We're meant to compare the gardens. Gethsemane begins Calvary, where there was a garden. Now compare the trees. The trees in Eden were planted by God. The tree of Calvary was planted by man. The tree in Eden of knowledge of good and evil, man was forbidden to eat of it. The tree of the cross, man is charged to eat of it. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. He that doesn't eat my flesh, drink my blood, has no life. It's a tree of life. To find Calvary is to find paradise. Associated with these trees are the words, in the midst. In the midst of the garden was there. Calvary, Christ is crucified in the midst. He's in the midst always between Father and Spirit, between life and death, between law and grace, between life and death. He's always in the midst. He's always central. If he's not central in your religion, you don't have a Christian religion. In the midst. In the midst. And would you notice this, that the seven marks of the fall are repeated at Calvary. Did you know that? The seven marks of the fall. Sweat, and the sweat of thy brow shalt thou eat bread. Sorrow, in sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of your life. Suffering, the sword, the curse, curse is the ground for your sake. 
Thorns and thistles, thorns and thistles will bring forth. And nakedness, and Adam is naked. All these things, sorrow, suffering, sword, nakedness, thorns, all seven that I've mentioned, they're all at Calvary. Christ is naked. He becomes a curse for our sake. He's a man of sorrows. He suffers for our sake. He bears all our sufferings. He wears a crown of thorns. All seven of the marks of the curse are refound in Calvary. Now, if you know this, and if you realise that when the four gospel writers wrote their gospels, they never ever said in brackets, now compare it with Eden. Here is a sign of the infinite wisdom and supernatural power of God that Calvary should replay Eden in order that we might find the cross, which is both a tree of life and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, of God's goodness and the evil of our hearts. Find that tree and you find paradise. And then when you come to chapter 4, you find a good shepherd who's killed while he's young. Hello? Have you heard that before? Abel's only a young man and he's a shepherd and he's murdered by the hatred of his brother. And Christ is a good shepherd and he dies at 33 and he's killed by the hatred of his brethren. Chapter 5, I've probably talked to you about it before. A reformer called Ursinus pointed out hundreds of years ago, if we get the names translated into their meanings, you get the whole gospel. Adam, man, Seth, appointed. Canaan, wretched, lamed, fallen man. Mahalalel, the blessed God, Jared shall descend. Enoch, dedicated, disciplined, teaching. His death shall bring Methuselah. Lamech, power, Noah, peace. Have you got it? Man appointed, but he becomes wretched, fallen. But the blessed God shall descend, dedicated, teaching, disciplined, and his death shall bring power and rest. Whole Gospels in chapter 5. In chapter 6, Noah represents every believer. What Ellie was talking about, Noah was counted righteous and so his family was saved. Jesus was righteous and if we become members of his family, we are saved. The ark is a picture of Jesus. In him we're safe. All the storm beat on him. It was covered with pitch. Different word for pitch. It's the same word used for atonement in Leviticus 16, about 16 times. We talked a little about the trees and I should have said to you that the trees are not only prominent in Genesis 2 and 3 but in chapter 8 after the fall we find that God comes visiting Abraham and he with two of his friends rests under the tree. The tree now after the fall becomes a place of rest. Find Jesus and you have rest. Then you move to Exodus 15, the next reference to a tree and a branch of a tree is put into the bitter waters and the bitter waters become sweet. There's no dodging the bitter waters of life. Doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter how good you are, how smart, how handsome, how pretty, how good you are, life has plenty of bitter waters. But if we will put the branch of the cross in, they will become sweet. If we will learn to surrender, if we will learn to trust him, trust him where you can't trace him. That's what faith is. Faith is not folly, it's not foolishness. There's abundant evidence to support faith, but faith is never demonstration. If we could demonstrate God, our worship would have no value. Suppose God came down every night over Brisbane and gave the Ten Commandments. Our worship would be a worship of fear. So faith has to have a semblance, beyond falling low of demonstration, but it has abundance of evidence to support it. I moved to chapter 14 and I find a man called Melchizedek a priest and a king of Salem. Melchizedek, it means king of righteousness. That's what it means. Salem means peace. He is a king and a priest, a king of righteousness and a priest of peace. And we're not told about his birth and we're not told about his death because he prefigures Jesus who has neither, who's eternal. And he blesses Abraham with bread and wine. Makes you think of the Lord's Supper. He gave them bread and he gave them wine. Christ is the true Melchizedek. And then in the 15th chapter, Abraham believed God, was counted to him for righteousness. First time you find the word believed in the Bible. First time you find the word righteousness. That's the way to righteousness, to trust God. Abraham believed and it was counted, reckoned, put to his credit for righteousness. And then in 22, 
the great father takes his son. And this is the first time in Genesis you find the words only son. This is the first time in Genesis you find the word love. Take your only son whom you love and offer him as a sacrifice on Moriah. Moriah is the same place as Jerusalem. So father and son go together. Christ could say, the father hasn't left me alone. He that sent me is with me. The wood for his sacrifice was on Isaac's back. And Christ bears his cross. And Isaac's under the sentence of death for three days. And then he's rescued from the altar as in resurrection, Hebrews 11. And after that, the servant of Abraham goes forth to find a wife. And after Christ's resurrection, the Holy Spirit goes into the world to find a wife for the resurrected Isaac Christ, the church. There are seven main characters in Genesis, seven righteous characters that give us our own biography from start to finish. Adam, the life of sin. Abel, the life of worship and conflict. Noah, the life of salvation as he enters into the ark. Abraham, the life of faith. Jacob, the life of service. Seven years for this wife, seven years for that one. So many years to his crooked father-in-law, life of service. And then Joseph, life of suffering with glory to come. You know there are a hundred parallels between the life of Christ and the life of Joseph. Many of the words of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are found in Genesis. Why is it there's only one chapter given to creation and there are 12 chapters given to the story of one man because you and I are important because God loves us. God loves us. God cares. Counts the hairs of our heads. Counts our groans. Counts our aspirations. Counts our hopes. Counts our sorrows. He loves us. I love thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I draw thee. Well, why do I have so much trouble if he loves me? Because pain is the best teacher. And so Joseph's life is the last life. It's a life of suffering with glory to follow. The seven lives follow pretty closely the Beatitudes that begin with the poor, the lost in spirit, like Adam. And finish with the man who's persecuted for righteousness' sake, but blessed in heaven, Joseph. And so I say to you today, if you and I really believe what Ellie's told us so beautifully, despite what we feel, I can confess I'm a weak, sinful, foolish, stupid sinner. And yet I'm accepted in the beloved and I'm complete in him. And despite all my mistakes, God counts me as though I've never sinned. I'm as precious to God as surely as Christ is precious to God. That is true for you, despite your mistakes, despite your failures, despite your sins. You're only seen in Christ. Luther said, mine are Christ living and dying as though I'd lived his life and died his death. That's true for you. That's true for me. Let's pray. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the book of Genesis. Thank you for there was a beginning Thank you that you were there as the one great circumstance of life. Thank you this coming an end, symbolised by the Sabbath day, a day of glory. Help us to rest under the tree of the cross. Help us to find our paradise there today. Thank you, Lord. Amen.